This is a pre-recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. However, all questions asked during the live presentation, along with answers, are included at the end of this presentation. To learn more about our upcoming patient and family conferences in your area, please visit aamds.org slash conferences. To view other recorded presentations or to register for other live online learning events, please visit aamds.org slash learn. Welcome to our live webinar titled Managing Chronic GBHD, 100 Days After Transplant and Beyond. Thank you for joining us. My name is Angie Onerford, Director of Patient Education at AAMDSIS, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to acknowledge the generous support of Be The Match and our patients and families and caregivers in making this webinar possible. To learn more about Be The Match, I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin Seip, who can tell you a little more about the organization. Thank you, Angie. Be the Match is operated by the National Marrow Donor Program, a nonprofit organization that matches patients with donors for a blood or marrow transplant. We also educate healthcare professionals and conduct research so more lives can be saved. The Be the Match Patient Support Center is dedicated to supporting patients, caregivers, and family members before, during, and after a transplant. We offer confidential, one on one support, financial guidance, and free educational resources like DVDs, booklets, online tools, and more. We can help patients, caregivers, and families learn more about transplant as a treatment option, plan for a transplant, and learn what to expect after a transplant. Thank you, Kaylin. Today's presenter is Dr. Carrie Kitko. Dr. Kitko joined the Vanderbilt Pediatric Hematology Oncology Division as the medical director of the Pediatric Stem Cell Transplant Program in June 2015. Dr. Kitko had previously worked at the University of Michigan, where she had developed a clinical and translational research focused in graft-versus-host disease. She was a key collaborator on the GVHD biomarker studies conducted within the overarching GVHD research theme of the Michigan BMT program, including the first authored paper demonstrating the elevations of CXCL9 are associated with new-onset de novo chronic GVHD. Her research efforts have concentrated on important post-transplant complications such as chronic GVHD diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. She has also developed a chronic GVHD clinical outcomes database and research sample repository as part of the BMT program database. She has also served on the Endpoint Response Committee for the Blood and Marrow Transplant Clinical Trials Network National Randomized Phase Three Clinical Trial for the Treatment of Chronic GVHD. She recently completed a five-year term as co-chair of the Pediatric Cancer Working Committee of the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research. In this role, she led international clinical outcomes research studies of pediatric recipients of bone marrow transplant. She is currently serving as Vice Chair of the GBHD Strategy Group for the Pediatric Blood and Marrow Consortium and will be serving as the Chair of the Pediatric Special Interest Group Meeting for the 2017 American Society of Blood and Marrow Transplantation Meeting. With that said, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Kiko. Thank you for the, the introduction and, and welcome everybody to the, today's presentation. Uh, just a little bit more about my background. When I was at Michigan, uh, I was uh, helping run our chronic GVHD program where I saw both adults and pediatric patients. So in case any of you were concerned about the, that this would be a pediatric-focused presentation, um, uh, it, it covers both aspects. So let's move forward. So uh, just to briefly outline what we're going to talk about today, we're going to discuss how we identify uh, chronic graft versus host disease, how we make that diagnosis. We're going to describe three common types of chronic GVHD, specifically the skin, the eyes, and the mouth. I'm going to summarize some new advances in treatment and also discuss some ways of trying to cope with some of the chronic GVHD symptoms that you might be experiencing. So just briefly about the um, transplant and the immune system. So when we do our transplants, we give our patients a graft from their donor, and that graft will include stem cells, but it also includes immune cells. And here's our patient, and they have those big black dots, which represent their leukemia or their lymphoma. 
So the good part about transplant, why we do this, is that many patients get the benefit of the graft versus leukemia effect. So those immune cells recognize the patient's cancer as being foreign or different and help eradicate and prevent any relapse of their underlying disease. Unfortunately, there is a flip side to that where you can have something called graft versus host disease. And early after transplant, the big three are the skin, the liver, and the gut, and rarely the lung as well. And GVHD can then make our patients get sicker. And again, just a brief reminder of acute versus chronic GVHD. Acute GVHD is the type that we see early after transplant. It can be very rapidly progressive, and the disease manifestations can be quite severe, sometimes even requiring readmission to the hospital. Skin, liver, and the gastrointestinal tract are the main targets. Steroids are considered the standard treatment for moderate to severe disease. Unfortunately, only about 40% of patients will respond to steroids as their treatment for GVHD. And for those patients, they have a high risk of actually dying from complications related to their graft-versus-host disease. Chronic graft-versus-host disease occurs later after transplant. The average length of time it takes to develop chronic GVHD is right around six months, but there will be some patients that present sooner and some that will present later. That being said, about 90% of patients will show some signs of chronic GVHD by the time they hit their one-year anniversary post-transplant. It can be challenging to make the diagnosis, and often patients have very vague symptoms when they first are presenting with signs of chronic graft-versus-host disease. However, as the disease progresses, some of these manifestations can become quite severe. Different than acute GVHD, chronic GVHD, virtually any organ can be involved. Steroids are still the standard of treatment for chronic GVHD as well, particularly for those patients that have moderate to severe disease. And once we have to pull that trigger to start treatment, the disease often requires treatment for about two to three years, so it is a chronic disease as well as happening later after transplant. And unfortunately, again, due to requiring a lot of immune suppression, uh, chronic GVHD can also be lethal. So this is um, how physicians often think about the different categories of graft versus host disease, and I think it just helps to understand a bit of the differences here. So that, uh, let's see if I can get my pointer to work. So we often think of classic acute GVHD as the early GVHD that happens early after transplant, less than 100 days, and it will really only be affecting the skin, the liver, and the gut, and there'll be nothing that looks like chronic GVHD. We used to think about GVHD almost like a line in the sand, where everything that happened before day 100 was called acute, and everything that happened after day 100 was called chronic but we're realizing that they really are probably two different diseases. And therefore, if I see like the classic bright red skin rashes, my patients have a lot of crampy belly pain and they're having a lot of diarrhea, that's acute GVHD. I don't care what day it is on the calendar. And some patients that maybe had their acute GVHD early, less than day 100, will have a flare as we start to try and taper their immune suppression. And that flare might happen after day 100. Well, that would still be considered acute GVHD, but it would either be persistent, recurrent, or sometimes even late onset. That's different than what, than what we think about as chronic GVHD, and I will talk about some of what these classic symptoms are. But again, if you have classic symptoms of chronic GVHD, I don't really care where it is on the calendar, and as long as they don't have any of those signs that I would normally see with acute GVHD, we would say that that was chronic graft versus host disease. Now, there are some patients that have what we consider overlap syndrome, where they have both some classic chronic GVHD symptoms as well as maybe some symptoms that we can also see with acute GVHD. So it's not as easy as just before day 100 and after day 100, unfortunately. So we do know that some patients are going to be at higher risk for developing chronic GVHD than others. Um, and as patients get older and undergo the transplant process, they seem more likely to develop chronic GVHD. If their donor is older, that also seems to be a risk factor as well for the development of chronic graft versus host disease. When we have a male patient 
who receives their donor cells from a female that also increases the risk for uh, GVHD. If when they get those stem cells to infuse into the patient, they choose to use peripheral blood stem cells versus doing a bone marrow harvest, the peripheral blood cells um, do seem to increase the risk of developing chronic GVHD as well. There are some centers that will do actually T cell depletion. So the T cells are very critical to causing graft versus host disease. And if you actually take them out before you do the transplant, that does impact on the risk of both acute and uh, chronic GVHD after the transplant. And probably one of the biggest risk factors for developing chronic GVHD is if you've had a history of acute GVHD. So these are all things to keep in mind. So again, getting back to what is um, the risk of, of developing um, chronic GVHD, this was looking back at um, almost 750 patients transplanted over a seven-year period where we broke it down um, by age. So adults age 21 and older have about a 57% incidence of developing chronic GVHD. So at least half of our patients will develop chronic GVHD. If I look at patients then in that next decade down, so from age 11 to 20, it's about a 50-50 chance of developing some chronic GVHD. And for the youngest kids, age 0 to 10, they have about a 27% chance or about a 1 in 4 chance of developing some chronic graft versus host disease. So how do we diagnose it? Well, there was a big project with the National Institute of Health initially back in 2005 which proposed some minimal criteria for both diagnosis and staging of chronic GVHD. So we used these um, in many clinical studies during the, the next decade, and in 2014, we actually went back and looked at those initial proposed um, criteria and said maybe some of these things were right and maybe some of these things were wrong, and we, we updated those in 2014. And what we have found is that the diagnosis can be established based on certain physical exam findings in certain organs. But sometimes biopsies or other studies may be required to confirm the diagnosis in other organs. So as I mentioned earlier, with chronic GVHD, virtually every organ in the body can be affected with chronic GVHD. And these are the main the eight or so that we typically um, score when we're thinking about our patients. So we look at their skin, their mouth, the eyes, the genitalia, the gastrointestinal tract, the liver, the lungs, and the muscles, joints, and fascia. Now there are other rare manifestations including um, nerve involvement and renal, in, or renal or kidney involvement, but the eight that I've listed up above, those are the ones that we uh, more commonly see. And I mentioned that some of these organs we can diagnose just based on our physical exam. And that would include our skin exam, our mouth exam, the genitalia, and the joints. So those four, just that your physician taking a look in, in those certain areas might be able to confirm the diagnosis of chronic graft versus host disease. So um, again, sort of getting back to like how we diagnose it, you need at least one diagnostic manifestation, and that's usually based on the physical exam. Or some of the, the physical exam findings aren't enough to say for sure a patient has it. They're, they're pretty commonly seen with chronic GVHD, but they might not be very specific. So some of those distinctive manifestations might mean that we still need to get a biopsy. Maybe there's some certain laboratory tests that we can get that will help confirm the diagnosis. Sometimes other tests like pulmonary function tests or a Schirmer's test, which is a way your ophthalmologist can test how dry your eyes are. Um, sometimes even the exam by a specialist, so the ophthalmologist has a special way of being able to look at the surface of the eye that gives us extra information that might confirm the diagnosis different than what your bone marrow transplant doctor can see. And then there's sometimes radiographic assessments that look for bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome or the lung-specific manifestations of chronic GVHD. So I'm going to walk through some of the, the physical exam findings that um, your physicians might be looking for when they're doing your regular checkups. So we're going to start by those diagnostic features. The, the doctor takes one look at your skin and says, yep, you have chronic GVHD. These are the five things that they would be looking for, and I'm going to show you some pictures. So poikiloderma is a very diffuse um, skin rash that has several different components. So some of those components are that you'll see areas where there's hyperpigmentation or the skin has actually gained extra color. 
There's also areas where the skin seems to have thinned and lost some of the pigment or hypopigmented areas. Then there's areas that are truly thinned and, um, and, and, and feel different than the other areas that have just loss of pigment. And then there's also areas where there's telangiectasias or there's very small capillaries that are very easily seen just under the skin. There's another type of rash that's called lichen planus-like. And as you can see here, this patient has areas which are very erythematous or red, and they're sort of well-demarcated lesions that we can see here. And that we call those violaceous plaques. And then you can also sometimes see patients that have these residual areas of hyperpigmentation, where you see these plaques right here. This would also be consistent with somebody that has some lichen planus-like changes. And some of the more severe patients will actually develop what we call sclerosis or thickening of the skin. And sometimes it's, um, the skin can be very tight and shiny and it's very obvious just looking or feeling the skin that it has some of these sclerotic changes. And sometimes these changes are happening underneath the skin. So the surface skin might feel okay, but underneath in what we, the subcutaneous tissue, that's where the sclerosis or scarring is happening and that's where you would uh, notice the changes. And sometimes that's manifest by what we call this rippling or sort of bumpy appearance. And this would be a more obvious that um, the skin would just be very hard, and this is called a stovepipe leg, where you can just see that the skin is really very tight, very thickened, and almost like right adherent directly to the bone here. This is a different type of skin manifestation called lichen sclerosis-like, and these are very silvery, I'm sorry, silvery plaques where there's sort of um, some loss of pigment, um, they're a little bit scaly, um, and, and this would be another sign of just looking at the skin and being able to say, I'm, I'm concerned that, that, that you might be developing some GVHD if I see these changes. So moving on to the mouth, um, initially, in 2005, we said that there were three different physical exam findings that we would say, if I see those, then for sure I think my patient has chronic GVHD. When we updated the recommendations in 2014, we took out two of these, and I'll, I'll explain why in a moment with some pictures. So the most common thing that we see are these lichen-type features, which are these white kind of lacy lines, a little bit of plaque formation that would be consistent with, with oral involvement um, with, with GVHD. Now, patients sometimes develop ulcers, and they sometimes develop um, areas that are more reddened or erythematous, but ulcers and erythema are, are nonspecific and can sometimes be seen with infection. So by themselves, they can't establish the diagnosis of chronic GVHD, but you will see them often in patients that do have the GVHD. So these are what we consider hyperkeratotic plaques, so these very thickened areas um, of, of white um, plaque on the parts of the patient's mouth. And why we've decided to not consider this a diagnostic feature is this, this can be a late finding in some of our patients and might actually be a concern for, for a new oral cancer. And so this is sometimes the end result of chronic GVHD in the oral cavity and not really a diagnostic manifestation. And these patients should probably be referred to a dentist or an oral surgeon to get a biopsy to make sure that the lesion has not become cancerous. And um, some of our patients can have a restricted oral opening where you can see this woman can't open her mouth quite as, as um, full as she used to before. And this is actually more because some of the, the skin around her mouth is tightened from some of the skin changes she has. So this is not considered um, diagnostic for the mouth, but it would be considered um, one of the findings that would support a, a skin GVHD diagnosis. And then finally, going to the, the joints. Um, that's the last category. And um, here is a picture of how your doctor might actually be making you do some different um, movements in clinic to see how good the range of motion is in some of your joints. So that if you were over here on this left side with sevens here or a four out of the ankle, this would be completely normal range of motion that we would see in our patients. 
And then on the opposite side, on a, the ones over here, these are the most restricted joints. And so these patients, we would be very concerned, have very severe um, graft versus host disease in their joints. And there's two ways that you might think about how our patients have joint involvement. Sometimes they can have that thickened skin that I showed you earlier, that sclerotic skin. And if it extends over a joint, it might actually be the skin that's causing the joint restriction. There's another group of patients, however, that their skin is, is relatively preserved, but that thickening process is happening. It's just happening deeper in the um, joint itself, in the, the fascia that line the joint and is causing the restriction. And here's a couple of pictures of some of our patients where you can see he's having some restricted um, movement here in his wrists where he's not able to fully um, bend his wrists. He's also not able to fully extend his, um, sh uh, his arms over his head. Um, so again, to briefly touch on the eyes, it's strongly recommended that our patients continue to follow with an ophthalmologist, particularly if our patients are complaining about dry eyes. Um, it's good to have the help of an ophthalmologist to do their specialized exam of the surface of the eye. They might also perform the Schirmer's test, which is where they will actually put a piece of paper sort of in the edge of your eye and see how much tear production you have. And so if you're not able to produce a lot of tears so that they actually measure, and then I'll have a picture here where it shows um, the different millimeter markings that we're looking at. So if you're not making more than five millimeters in five minutes on the, on the uh, little piece of paper, that would be considered consistent with the dry eyes of um, chronic GVHD, or if they're seeing with their specialized exam looking at the surface of the eye, some specific changes, keratoconjunctivitis sicca by their special slit lamp exam with also some of the dry eye with the paper test, these would also help confirm the diagnosis of chronic GVHD of the eye. And this, again, is sufficient to make that diagnosis without having to do a biopsy or any additional tests. And this is what it looks like. So they can actually put this little piece of paper, sort of it bends, and the, there's a, a, a sort of piece of the paper that is on the inside of the eye, and they measure after five minutes how, how far down the, the tears will make this paper wet. And you can see that this patient is pretty normal and has, has good tear production. So um, again, I just focused on those particular organs. Um, one thing to mention is that, uh, that I would like to mention and is that we're not going to focus on is that um, in particular for our female patients, it's very common to see oral manifestations and vaginal manifestations at the same time. And sometimes, um, you know, I think women are concerned about raising topics of burning or irritation in the vaginal area. They, they might um, not understand that some of those uh, complaints might actually be related to graft versus host disease. So, you know, in particular, again, if you're having mouth sensitivity and you start to have vaginal sensitivity, please mention that to your physician so that we can make sure that we are addressing all of your complaints in all of the areas where the graft versus host disease might be active. So moving on to treatment, some of our patients have only mild manifestations and we're able to, to just treat with topical therapy and that might be topical therapy to the skin or the mouth or just the eyes or even some of those vaginal changes I just mentioned can sometimes be treated with only topical therapy. However, once patients start to have moderate to severe disease, then we often need to think about systemic therapy. And our standard treatment is steroids or prednisone, and we typically are doing a dose of about a milligram per kilogram per day. That would be considered our standard dose. And the way steroids work is they're just a very broad anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive medicine. So it's not targeted. You hear a lot about targeted therapy. Steroids are sort of just the nuclear bomb. It hits everything and, and the good and the bad, which is why when patients are on steroids that we get very concerned about their risk of infection. Unfortunately, even with giving that standard therapy, about half of our patients are going to need an additional agent, either because they have some response but we're not able to taper or um, they're not responding quickly enough and so we want to try and, and add another agent to see if we can get things under control. And unfortunately, there really is no standard second-line agent. 
and we're going to discuss several um, different possible second agents, but in general, most second agents have a response rate of about 30%. And once we pull this trigger to give systemic therapy, the average length of time that patients will be on treatment for their chronic GVHD is two to three years. Now, it's not always that they're on the high doses of steroids that whole time, and in fact, hopefully they're not. Hopefully we're slowly tapering. Um, I think one of the lessons with chronic GVHD is really patience, um, sort of starting therapy, getting a response, leaving patients on that therapy for a while while the inflammatory process is sort of cooling off and then gradually tapering to try and avoid more flares. Um, but even at seven years after starting treatment for chronic GVHD, there's still 15% of patients that are still on some level of immune suppression. But the flip side of that is 85% of the majority of patients will actually eventually be able to stop treatment for their chronic GVHD. So this is kind of a detailed slide, but I think it helps explain the sort of buckets that I think about. What, what are the problems? Where are the problems? What cells are causing this, and how can I target it? So I think that we have sort of three groups of cells. So we actually still have the T cells that we worried about with um, acute GVHD. So these are T cells that are just recognizing the patient's body as being foreign or different and attacking it. So the other cell is the B cell. So there's, these are both what we consider lymphocytes, and they come in the T cell form and the B cell form. B cells are not as critical for acute graft-versus-host disease, but they have definitely found to be very active in chronic GVHD. And so we're going to talk about some of the therapies that target B cells in just a few minutes. And then I think the other piece of, of the lymphocyte puzzle that we're learning more about is there's a third group of lymphocytes that are called regulatory cells. And we also have ways of trying to amp up these regulatory cells. I think of these cells as sort of the policemen of the immune system. They sort of go off and tell these alloreactive T cells or B cells to cool off. Don't, don't be causing that damage that you're doing. So if we can just increase the number of these regulatory cells, that is also helpful in trying to get the GVHD under control. So the second line agents that I'm going to talk about are extracorporeal photophoresis, or ECP, I'm also going to discuss low-dose interleukin-2, or IL-2, and those are both um, agents that are going to sort of target increasing that regulatory T cell population. Then the other two regimens that I'm going to talk about are rituximab and abrutinib, and those are agents that go after those B cells. So um, there's a lot of evidence with um, extracorporeal photophoresis. There have been many studies. It's actually been um, around for more than 20 years. And several phase two studies have shown that for patients refractory to steroid um, GVHD, that it seems like the salvage rates are better than you would expect. Um, some of the problems why you don't see the same results with every study is that until those um, NIH guidelines for both diagnosis and staging, as well as there's a separate paper just about how, how do we define response, what do we consider a meaningful response, until those papers came out, there was not a lot of consistent definition of response in, in the medical literature, unfortunately, and so that sometimes makes it hard for your physicians to compare one study to another, but that's improving with um, more um, application of these guidelines. Some of, the, some of the spots or the organs that respond best to ECP include the skin and the mucosal disease, about a 50% response rate for skin and mucosal, which would be things like mouth involvement, vaginal involvement. Um, the other thing that leads to sometimes uh, difficulty in interpreting results is that there are very different schedules reported in the literature. So how often you give ECP and for how long you give ECP. So one of the things that we've learned is that short duration, trying to give ECP for less than 12 weeks seems to be not as effective. So if we decide we need to do ECP, patients are typically treated for at least six months. And um, we've also found that the earlier we decide to use it seems to make a difference in how likely patients are to respond. So there were, you were more likely to have a good response to ECP if you were treated early, and typically within one month of diagnosis was where they saw the best results. 
And there was even um, a randomized phase two study that did show that patients that got randomized to ECP were more likely to be able to, uh, to um, taper their steroid dose, which is a good thing to avoid some of the toxicity of steroids. So if you are unfamiliar with ECP, this is what it looks like. So this is the um, machine. Here's my arrow, hang on. There we go. So this is the big machine where um, this will eventually be doing the separation of the blood. So what we do is the patient is identified as a good patient for ECP. Then we are able to, um, either through a central venous line or even through peripheral IV sometimes, we're able to do a leukapheresis, which means that we actually draw the patient's blood out into the machine. We're able to separate out just the white blood cells, so the white blood cells are maintained in the machine, and the rest of the patient's blood, the red blood cells, the platelets, the plasma component, are given back to the patient. The patient's white cells are then treated with a special medicine called methoxysorolin, and then a special light, a UVA light, is uh, shined on those cells, and that will cause those cells to undergo death and dying over the next 24 to 72 hours. And what happens is these cells that we treated, we actually infuse those back into the patient. And as those cells undergo this death process, the cells that weren't treated in the patient recognize those dead and dying cells, and that actually causes a change in the patient's immune response so that there's more regulatory T cells around, and they will then go off and tell those alloreactive cells to not cause the damage. So this is, um, I think, one of the big pros of ECP. We consider it immune modulatory, but not immune suppressive. And it definitely has a steroid sparing effect for patients that respond to this treatment. Once we start ECP, we're often able to slowly taper their steroids and not see a flare. So that's a, that's a good thing. There are some downsides, as I mentioned before. In order to do the leukophoresis component, some patients are still going to need a central line, um, depending on lots of things. Uh, you know, do you have good peripheral veins still that they can be able to to get those IVs every time they do it or, or not. Um, it does mean that patients need to make frequent trips to the hospital or the clinic for treatment, and each treatment takes about three to four hours. So it's a big time commitment, which I think is a big downside for some patients and families. They might not be able to easily get back to their transplant center to receive ECP treatment. So some of the animation didn't come in here correctly. I'm sorry for that. Um, so the next treatment that also uh, seems to help increase the number of regulatory T cells is something called low-dose interleukin-2, or IL-2. And there have been two very nice um, clinical studies for a total of only about 64 patients. Uh, but these patients received low-dose IL-2. Um, they were able to give themselves daily subcutaneous injections of this medicine. They, can, they are taught initially at the hospital, but eventually the patients are giving themselves these shots at home. These shots would be similar to a patient giving themselves insulin shots. And they do these daily for 8 to 12 weeks, and then if they were found to have improvement in their chronic GVHD, they could continue the treatment for longer. And these, this was a group of patients that had failed at least two prior therapies before going on to these clinical trials. And about half of the patients had an objective response. Most of these were partial response. So I think only one patient, if I recall correctly, had complete resolution of all their symptoms. But most, the, those that responded did have improvements. And, and the majority that showed some improvement chose to continue to take their interleukin shots, giving those daily shots for more than a year. There are some side effects with this treatment, mostly that's flu-like symptoms. The patients are more tired, they get fevers, they might be kind of achy. Uh, but not everybody has those symptoms. Um, and then a small group of patients also had a lowering of their platelet count. But the results were very encouraging, and they're actually planning on opening very soon a multi-center clinical trial studying this in pediatrics. And this is an example of, of some of the improvements that they saw. So the, the, this is a before patient, and this is after. So you can see there's still, if I had to count the like surface of the, the stomach that's involved, it's probably still about the same surface area that's involved, but certainly the amount of erythema is significantly less, 
And if you talk to the doctors treating this patient, they would say that some of these areas were very tight, very stiff. You couldn't even really pinch the skin. But over here, they could actually start pinching the skin and moving it around a bit more. And then this is the same thing here, but a different patient with their leg involvement. So you can see lots of ulcerations, very dry, lots of um, areas that are reddened and irritated, and it's much improved, not as much scaling, not nearly the same degree of erythema or redness involved. So now we're gonna move on to those two therapies that are directed at the B cells. So rituximab, some of you might be familiar, maybe um, your indication to transplant was that you had a lymphoma that you actually received rituximab for. Well, many lymphomas actually come out of abnormal B cells, and so we take advantage of that for several diseases, GVHD included, that also um, have abnormal B cells. And so what rituximab does is it directly targets and kills those B cells. Our patients come in for a weekly infusion for four weeks. The response rates have been extremely variable. So some have been as low as 27% and some have been as high as 70%. Um, some of that difference might be, again, similar to ECP. If, if this was sort of um, used earlier in the treatment course, you were more likely to see a response than if this was the fourth or fifth drug that you decided to try for somebody's resistant GVHD. Um, one of the pros is that there's been, uh, it's been shown to be beneficial in some of that worst of the skin GVHD, those that have the sclerodermatous skin changes. Some of the cons is that as patients are recovering their B cells after having received the rituximab, we sometimes see this late autoimmune neutropenia, um, where all of a sudden patients actually have low neutrophil count because the, as the B cells are recovering, some of those B cells are actually now um, destroying the, the, the neutrophils. It tends to be temporary, um, and the patients do uh, eventually have self-resolution of that problem, but it's sort of adding um, insult to injury in a small handful of our patients. Um, the, the piece to anticipate in everybody is that there will be prolonged B cell depletion. So again, it's an expected um, toxicity. The rituximab doesn't know a good B cell from a bad B cell. So it will get rid of the good B cells. And, and when a B cell is doing its job, it's making immunoglobulin. And so patients will have a, a period of time where most will need IV IG supplementation. So IV immunoglobulin supplementation for those low um, levels. This is showing a study where patients actually got randomized to receive two different drugs. They were randomized to receive either rituximab or imatinib. And all of the patients treated on this trial had that sclerodermatous or thickened skin. And unfortunately, by six months, most had failed on either arm the therapy and needed to add another new agent. So for some patients, about half of the patients had seemed to be beneficial, but half of the patients still needed to go on to receive a different agent. So ibrutinib is um, an exciting uh, newer treatment. It also um, helps target those B cells. It makes it doesn't get rid of the B cells, but it makes the, it harder for that B cell to activate and cause problems. The way it works, the, the sort of molecule in the B cells it targets is also um, similar to a molecule inside T cells. So we do get some benefit of, of maybe inhibition of some of the T cells as well. This is a pill, so that makes it a little bit more convenient for our patients where they can take a pill once a day. And the study that um, showed that this was helpful in chronic GVHD had 42 patients. All of these patients had chronic GVHD that involved either the skin or oral involvement. So they had to have rash on about 25% of the surface of their skin or um, symptomatic oral involvement. Um, and they couldn't be too far into their chronic GVHD therapy. They could have only been on up to three other agents before enrolling on this study, and the majority had seen at least two other treatments. So of those 42 patients, 28 actually had a response. There were nine that had a complete response and 19 that had a partial response. So 67% of patients that were given ibrutinib had some evidence of response. And there was not a fixed endpoint. If you were improving, you got to continue taking the drug. And so some of these patients have been on the drug for more than a year now. The common side effects that we see with ibrutinib include being um, fatigued, having some diarrhea, 
and a few um, noted that they had worsening muscle spasms. And so these are some of the results where they show how long the patients responded to the drug. And so this is the time they started, and this is how far out the patients are. And you can see who had a complete remission in green and who had a partial remission in blue. There's a few that, that um, had stable disease for a piece, and then the reds were the progressive. So not a lot of red on this chart, which is a good thing. So about 70% of the responders continued to show that they maintained that res response even out to 20 weeks from, from when they initially had the response. So this seems what we call durable response, which we like to see. This shows, in addition, not only did they maintain that either complete response or partial response, but even as we we're seeing that, that good um, stability of their disease, we're tapering the steroids. So we're tapering the medicine that we think causes more toxicity. So that by you know, 48 weeks after starting, 67% of patients had been weaned down to a pretty small dose of steroids. So that, we think, is also a nice improvement. And so even though this is a small study, this drug has now been FDA approved, and this is actually the first FDA approved therapy for the treatment of chronic GVHD. So all this, the treatments I've mentioned before, many of your physicians will be very familiar and will use those medicines on a routine basis, but it's not the FDA approved reason that those medicines exist. Um, and in fact, abrutinib was came online to treat a certain kind of cancer first, and we found out that it's helpful for, for GVHD. So that, that's often the case in, in our world of graft versus host disease. We, we find medicines that we think might be effective in other areas and, and, and see then if they might work in our patients. So then moving on to things outside of um, adding more immune suppression, what else can we do to maybe help with some of the symptoms that our patients have with chronic GVHD? So one of the things to keep in mind is that many organs that are targeted by chronic GVHD develop what we think of this fibrosis or scarring, and often this will not be reversible, or at least um, with any of the medicines that we know about today. And some examples of this are that dry eye um, that, that we talked about, or even those sclerodermatous thickened changes in the skin. Those, those types of GVHD are very hard to get a patient back completely normal again. So many of the supportive care that we offer can give patients relief without necessarily adding more immune suppression. So for skin, some of the things that I always like to um, recommend to my patients is, as I, I want you to hear, that skin cancer is the most common secondary cancer that we see in our patients. So it's super important to always wear sunscreen, even if you think you're in the shade. <laughs> Um, and sunscreen um, is important not only because of the skin cancer risk, but I have also seen patients where they get exposed to sun and it triggers their graft versus host disease. And they start saying like, oh, it's just a little bit of sunburn from being out in the sun. And then they sort of look and think, well, gosh, now the sunburn's on areas where the skin wasn't shining or the sun wasn't shining on my skin. And oh, now my mouth is really sore. So sometimes once you sort of open that Pandora's box, you get, you get GVHD in other spots, and it was all triggered by some sun exposure. The other thing to be aware of is, is what other drugs are you on, because sometimes those drugs can increase your sensitivity to the sun. And in particular, voriconazole is notorious for this. So voriconazole really increases your um, skin sensitivity to the, to the sun, and unfortunately, the rash that it causes can look a heck of a lot like bad graft versus his disease. So sometimes, you know, I've seen patients get sort of, you know, one or two additional drugs to treat their chronic GVHD, and then somebody finally realizes, you know what, they're on voriconazole, they've been in the sun a lot, let's stop their voriconazole, and then the rash gets better. So these are just some simple things that you can be doing that might make a big difference in how your skin um, appears. The other thing is just go back to the basics. A good moisturizer will often help some of the things like the erythema, the dryness, the scaliness. And there's just a few examples of some good moisturizers to, to consider trying. Um, so most of our patients that have skin GVHD, even if they're on um, systemic or oral um, prednisone, will also be on some topical steroids. And you know, one thing to keep in mind, just because one formulation did not work, it's okay to try another. The same is true for the lotions. Maybe you know you heard that you know another patient loved Lubriderm, so go try the Lubriderm. You know, you've been trying Aquaphor; it's not doing anything for you. Try different lotions, and just because one worked for your friend might not be the best one for you. 
And the same is true with the different steroid formulations. There is, you know, a whole, you know, bucket load of different steroids that we can try. The other thing to be aware of is that you might be prescribed a different steroid for your face than for your body. And that's because different potencies, some of the steroids are very strong and they should be avoided on certain body areas. So again, the high potency steroids should not be generally used on the face. The other piece is that we try and avoid using them continuously for more than 14 to 21 days to avoid resistance. So you might do sort of um, short bursts where you do them more frequently for a couple of weeks and then try and take a break for a week or so before you start using them again. So for the mouth, I think another really important thing is to reestablish care with your dentist around 6 to 12 months after your transplant. Again, that's just general advice. Please discuss that with your doctor before making an appointment with your dentist. There might be specific complications that you're, you are experiencing where they prefer that you not go see a dentist just yet. But the majority of patients should be um, seen by their dentist before they hit their one-year anniversary. And something important to know is that all of our patients, just because of having gone through the transplant process, having received chemotherapy and or radiation therapy, will have less saliva production. And that um, saliva is really important because if you don't have as much around, you don't get rid of some of the, the normal bacteria in our mouths, and that leads to an increased risk of cavities. And if you have chronic GVHD of the mouth, that dryness is probably even worse, which, again, further increases your risk of developing cavities. And some of our patients with chronic GVHD are actually seen by their dentist every three months to monitor very closely for dental issues. Um, sometimes they even get some extra fluoride treatments. Um, and this is just another person to be having a good look in the mouth to make sure that some of those white lacy lines that we see in, in, inside our patients' mouths haven't somehow changed and become more like one of those hyperkeratotic plaques or those thickened areas that might be a sign of a subtle change that might be um, at risk for, for change into a cancer. So getting to some of the specific mouth symptoms, uh, so some of our patients get what we call mouth sensitivity, and this is worsened with eating, particularly things like acidic or spicy food. So you know, I had a patient that you know, loved Kung Pao chicken, and all of a sudden he couldn't eat his spicy chicken anymore because you know, what used to be a good burn was a really bad burn. And sure enough, we looked in his mouth, and, and he had some changes consistent with having new chronic GVHD in his mouth. So some things to help using blander toothpaste, some of the natural toothpaste um, might help be less um, bothersome to the mouth. Um, the other thing is to make sure if you're somebody who likes to use a lot of mouth rinses, make sure they don't have a lot of alcohol. A lot of the things like Listerine and things like that have alcohol, and if you already have sort of a, you know, erythematous or ulcerative area in your mouth, that alcohol is really going to burn, so try and avoid those. Um, the other thing is to make, you know, if your doctor has prescribed some steroid mouth rinses, making sure you're using them the right way. So if you are prescribed those, it's really recommended that you take about, you know, five milliliters or a tablespoon of the, of the steroid mouth rinse, keep it in your mouth for as long as you can, about four to six minutes, and you can do, and then spit it out, don't swallow it, because if you swallow it, it's now become a systemic therapy and not a topical therapy, um, and you, should, you can do that up to three to six times a day. And the other piece is really trying to avoid food or drink for about 30 minutes afterwards to increase the effectiveness that the steroid has um, sort of been on that, on that area of the mouth. But remember, when, when you put steroids in the mouth, that does increase the risk of thrush. And so a lot of times we will consider actually giving a patient a prescription for Nystatin as well or, or some other um, treatment to try and prevent uh, thrush on top of having oral GBHD. And one of the common um, uh, swish and spits is, is with dexamethasone, although there's others out there as well. For the dryness that patients have, um, there are actually artificial salivas and oral lubricants that can be used. These are generally over the counter, and I've listed the name of several there that you could consider trying. Um, sometimes your doctor might per, uh, decide to, to actually give a systemic, what we call silagog which actually helps stimulate um, saliva production. So um, Evazac is the most common one used, although there are some others out there. And some patients, this is very effective. Um, the other thing that dentists will um, often tell our patients is that if you chew sugar-free gum, one that typically has um, xylitol in it, like Trident, 
um, or calcium phosphate, like Trident Extra Care, those also do help stimulate saliva flow and can actually help prevent caries as well. So those are some tricks to maybe help improve your mouth dryness. And then the eyes, um, so if patients are really having bad dry eyes, um, they often you know, go to the store and buy themselves some artificial tears. But one of the things to keep in mind is if your eyes are so dry that you find yourself using them every few hours, or definitely if you're using them at least four times a day or more, please make sure that you've purchased ones that are preservative free. The preservative in the, in the artificial tears can actually make the eye irritation worse if you're using those drops really frequently. If you're only using them like when I wake up in the morning or right before I go to bed, my eyes are a little dry and I'm putting some drops in, the preservatives probably don't make that much of a difference. But if you get the ones without preservatives in them, you can use them as often as every 30 minutes. And again, similar to the different lotions I talked about, there are lots of different artificial tears and definitely patients will have their favorites. So just because one brand didn't work, go out and try one of the other brands. Maybe you'll like one, one more than another. And here's some examples of, of ones that are out there. And I definitely have had patients come in saying, oh, Refresh is the only one that works for me. And then I go in the next room and they're like, oh, what's he talking about? Sustain is the one. So go out there and experiment. Find one that you think is, is helpful. And there are even thicker solutions, almost like ointments, that, that do make your vision a little bit blurry. So these aren't great to use during the daytime, but they can help increase the, the um, moisture in the eye and are very helpful to put in right before you go to bed at night. For patients that are really on the severe end where they really have no to minimal um, tear production, there are a few um, things that can be done, although they're not always available at every center. So there are some places that can actually take um, a patient's blood and, and develop eye drops from the serum. So they actually draw a certain amount of, um, of, of blood and they separate out just the serum and they make special eye drops from that serum. Um, and I've had some patients that have really raved about this, but again, it, there's pretty limited availability about a compounding pharmacy that's able to make these for you. Um, some patients, again, good to have your ophthalmologist involved, they can actually get punctal plugs placed. So this is where the tear duct is actually blocked. So one of the, the way our eyes work is we actually sort of make our tears from the outer corner of the eye and they sort of sweep across the eye and then they drain actually through the tear duct that's close to our nose. And so if you put a, a plug in that tear duct, whatever minimal tears are being produced are gonna stay in contact with the eye for a longer period of time. And for some patients, that's very effective. And finally, there are actual specialized devices. Um, one in particular are called pros lenses. It's a very um, specialized type of fitted contact. Um, they are only available though at very specialized centers to be able to make these. So again, it, it might not be around the corner from you to be able to get these. But for some patients that have had this done, it has been really helpful. It really helps uh, support healing, reduces symptoms, and can really make a big impact on the quality of life. I've had, I've had patients literally you know, go from not being able to um, you know, read a computer screen, read a book, watch the TV, to getting these lenses, and now they become much more functional just by having these specialized contacts. So I, I, I do recommend those if, for our patients that have very severe dry eyes. And I think one of the common complaints that we have um, from a lot of patients are muscle cramps. And this is one, one of the more frustrating symptoms that we have. It, it's very strongly associated with patients that have chronic GVHD, but unfortunately does not typically respond to standard chronic GVHD treatment. And what I mean by that is, is that a patient might come and they have those lichenoid changes in their mouth, they have some of the classic skin findings, and I say for sure that patient has chronic GVHD, I've diagnosed it, and they're also complaining about a lot of muscle cramps. I start them on steroids and I'm lucky. This is one of the patients that gets better. Their mouth starts to feel better, their rash starts to improve, but heck, I'm still having those cramps all the time. And so the, the, they go together, but they don't necessarily respond to treatment. So just some of the, the, the basics, common sense things, you know, trying to keep yourself well hydrated, thinking about having your potassium or magnesium levels checked, sometimes supplements for those will help as well. Um, vitamin B complex can help in some patients and can be taken three times a day. 
doesn't have a lot of toxicity associated with it, so it's a, a, a treatment that I often try in my patients because I think there's not a lot of risk to trying it. As a last line, you can think about muscle relaxants, but again, then I worry about my patients driving and being able to work if they have uh, muscle relaxants on board. And for some patients that have um, their symptoms worse at night, you can think about Requip, which is something you might have seen for on TV for patients that have restless leg syndrome. It also does seem to help in some of our patients that have cramps that are really bad at night. So those were some of the supportive care suggestions that I had, um, but I'm happy to talk about other areas or if you had other questions about treatment, I, I, I feel free to open it up to questions at this point. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Kitko, for your very informative presentation. Um, we did get quite a few questions. Um, our first question comes from Mike, and Mike would like to know, how do you determine if a patient is suffering from GVHD or suffering from side effects of medications? I, I think that's <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I think that we always try and and look at a patient's medication list and think if what I'm giving them could somehow be contributing. I think the voriconosol st story I told is one of the most obvious um, examples that we have. Um, luckily, there are newer um, antifungal medicines out, so we try and um, put our patients on some of those other antifungals that aren't associated with the photosensitivity. Um, sometimes we run into problems, though, that insurance won't cover. You know, they prefer one of the antifungals over one of the others. So we, we do run into that. Um, sometimes, um, depending on the organ that's involved, sometimes we have to get a biopsy um, because sometimes the biopsy will help make a difference, and sometimes you'll see that with the skin um, in particular that you will find certain changes that are more classic with GBHD than a drug rash. Sometimes even with a biopsy, though, it can be hard, hard to say. Um, and I think the, the bottom line or the, the sort of last step is, you know, sometimes it's trial and error. You know, we, I listen closely to my patients, and if they say, I wasn't having the symptom until you started X drug, you know, then maybe we try and, and see if we can taper that drug or if it's a drug that we can just start and stop, try and stop it and see if the symptoms get better. But there is a lot of trial and error, unfortunately, with chronic GVHD, um, since we don't have very many FDA-approved drugs in that area. All right. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Meredith. Meredith would like to know, does the number of blood transfusions before transplant increase the risk of GVHD? That is not one of the um, common uh, risk factors that I that I associate with risk of, of graft versus host disease. There are some risks to the transplant if the patient has had a lot of blood transfusions coming in. Um, actually, mostly that we worry that those patients are less likely to engraft, so that we go through the whole process, we give you your prep regimen, we use the stem cells, um, we might have a harder time for those stem cells actually to you know, find the bone marrow and start making new red cells and white cells and platelets again. That's the, the biggest risk associated with, with having um, received a lot of transfusions before the transplant, but I don't associate it with chronic GBHD. All right. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Fred. Um, Fred is 67 and is getting ready to undergo a transplant. Um, he is asking, are there any tests that he should have done to get a baseline before his transplant that would help in future evaluations of GVHD? For example, an eye exam to determine any current eye issues before transplant. That's a great question. So I, I, will, I will say practices vary. Um, so one transplant center, you know, might be very focused on, on having patients see, see subspecialists beforehand. My own practice is absolutely, I try and have all my patients go see an ophthalmologist, um, for example, or a gynecologist for my female patients before transplant because sometimes they might already have dry eyes or they might already have other symptoms, you know, uh, vaginal dryness, you know, perhaps because of, of um, uh, menopause or things like that. And so knowing what the baseline function is, I think, can be very helpful going into the transplant so that you, when you see these post-transplant, if they're at the same level that they were before, then that's just the patient's baseline and we don't necessarily need to be starting new treatments for something that, that pre-existed the transplant. All right. Thank you. 
Uh, our next question comes from Corinne. Uh, Corinne would like to know, do transplant patients always need to be concerned about developing GVHD? Um, she is six years post-transplant. So um I will I so I tell my patients that as if we have done our if it, if the transplant has gone well and we have weaned off all the immune suppression which is always the goal and we and we still don't see a flare or new onset of disease within you know some window of time probably somewhere on the order of 3 to 4 months after coming off of all their immune suppression it's very rare to then spontaneously develop it. The, the high risk time for seeing new onset of disease is as we're tapering that immune suppression. So I would say that if somebody is six years out and off all immune suppression and has been for a couple of years, it would be very unusual to then suddenly come back to their doctor and have new symptoms of chronic GBHD. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Quinn. Uh, Quinn's sister was treated twice with ATG cyclosporin and now is going to transplant. Does the treatment increase her risk of GVHD? Um, no, I, I would say that that pretreatment should not make a difference for the risk of graft versus host disease. All right, thank you. And I believe we're um, at our very last question. Um, this last question comes from Anne. Anne would like to know, is there a diet transplant patients should follow after transplant, and does this help with decreasing the risk of GI issues? That is a good question. There, um, We don't know of a specific diet that, that makes um, a difference. I will say depending on... Where, the, where in their transplant course the patients are, we might be more strict on things like um, uh, like raw um, fish, raw um, uh, vegetables, uh, things like that that um, might be more likely to contain bacteria, things like that. So at my center, we call it a modified microbial diet. So when patients are actively going through transplant and they don't have any white blood cells, we worry that that's sort of a high-risk time where they could get some foodborne illnesses. Um, so that's a period of time where we sort of modify the diet in hopes of reducing some complications, although not GBHD specifically. As you get further out from the transplant, we start loosening some of those guidelines. Some of the patients will have um, issues with their gut and when they have chronic GVHD. Um, it tends to be different than acute GVHD. Acute GVHD, we talked about having like crampy belly pain and lots of diarrhea. What we see with our um, chronic patients is sometimes they have what we call malabsorption. So they might eat plenty of food, but they're still losing weight, or they um, sort of always have looser stools, not maybe diarrhea, but just always very loose stools because they're not absorbing things as well. So those patients might require some diet modifications, um, sometimes even um, maybe some extra medicines to help them absorb some of the nutrients a bit better. But beyond those um, particular diet um, recommendations, um, I don't think we know today what there is an emerging field about what we call the microbiome. So that's a fancy word for the bacteria that normally live in and on our bodies. And we are learning a lot about the good bacteria that live in our gut and that we see changes in the patterns of which bacteria are there in patients that are likely to get graft versus host disease. But we haven't been able to take it that extra step to say what role diet might play in what those bacteria are. In fact, we think it might have more to do with the antibiotics that we, we sometimes have to give our patients. It's probably the antibiotics that are changing what bacteria we see in our gut um, more than the diet. That was probably a longer answer than she wanted, but <laughs> that's what I can tell you about diet and uh, GBHD. All right. Well, I believe those are all the questions that we have. 
Um, thank you so much, Dr. Kiko, for your wonderful presentation and for your time. Um, I would also just like to add that if you are currently still with us and you would like to rewatch this webinar at a later time, please be on the lookout for an email that will provide you with an archive link within four to seven business days. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation and Be the Match, we would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us and making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. If we were not able to answer your question today, please send it to us via email at help, that's H-E-L-P, at A-A-M-D-S dot org, so that our patient educator can respond. Or visit our online academy at, a at A-A-M-D-S dot org forward slash learn for interviews with experts and other programs that may address your question. As a reminder, as soon as I'm done speaking, a post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. We appreciate your time to complete this survey. Again, thank you for joining us, and remember, learning is hope. This concludes today's program.